Okay. The ceremonial button pressing has commenced. Record on my side. Play on yours. Here we are. This is Jay Brown Yoga Talks podcast. My name is Jay Brown. Welcome, one and all. New person, returning listener, whoever you are. Thanks for tuning in today. Let me ask you a question. In the last week or two, have you come to some new awareness about yourself through a seemingly small change or some little thing that you might do or some aspect of your life that you you have the power to change and that in doing so it opens up some new kind of perceptual lens some new perspective on yourself some awareness of your conditioning perhaps I'm asking because I was having a conversation earlier this week with some fellow teachers in my weekly teacher sangha, which anybody listening to this can also join in on, by the way. And we were discussing this, and some of my friends were sharing things that they were discovering in themselves through these seemingly small little changes, these little lifestyle choices, I guess you could say. And I had one of those epiphanies as well over the last few weeks. So I'm curious if this is like a thing in the stars, if there's like some cosmic thing going on here. And I'm not talking about New Year's resolutions necessarily. I'm not talking about trying to like go to the gym more or whatever we're doing for New Year's. Even me last week when I was talking about not wanting to yell at my kids or wanting to have a certain approach to parenting as a kind of resolution. That's just a kind of directive I want to give myself, like some sense of how I want to be or something I want to hold myself to. What I'm talking about is like, I don't know, it's a different kind of uh, opening that happens. And it's kind of seemingly happens in an a place that you wouldn't necessarily think it was coming. And I know I'm being vague. I'll talk more about it perhaps on the other side of today's talk with Lisa Peterson. And I think it would be beneficial to hear from her first because a lot of what we talk about has to do with opening up new places in yourself. Specifically, Lisa is someone who I consider to be a sort of bridge between somatic movement modalities and yoga practice. And that's a conversation we've had on the show for quite some time. You know, I've had a lot of folks on because many of us, and I'm including myself, have certainly drawn upon these other movement modalities and incorporated them into what we do as yoga teachers and have found that we got something from those movement modalities that was lacking. And that's a kind of a (laughs) a risky thing to say, I guess, or I guess it depends on who your teacher was, but that there are certain benefits to embracing movement modalities that are not necessarily coming from yoga traditions because in many ways they are teaching the same things and sometimes their methods, I don't know if you call it methods, but their approaches are actually more effective in certain ways than other kinds of traditional practices that I've studied. So Lisa, someone I wanted to talk to for a long time about this, she's well-versed on both sides of that. And I think, as she says, you'll hear, considers herself a bit of an ambassador. (laughs) And so it was perfect to have this opportunity to connect with her. It is my pleasure to be sharing it with you today. 
Real quick before we get to that, I do have some shout outs to give. Today, I want to recognize Katerina Adolph and Mandy Huff. Shout out to you, Katerina, who I think might also be Kathy sometimes. Katerina or Kathy, whichever it is. And Mandy, really appreciate you supporting the show. And you know, I'm not really supposed to talk about this yet, I don't think. But we've got some interesting things planned for a podcast premium. Some ways to really thank those who've been supporting and maybe incentivize more people to participate in podcast premium. But I'm not really supposed to talk about that yet. In any case, it might be a good idea to uh, subscribe now. Not only do you get access to the full archives, but... You also help us keep the show going. And like I said, we've got some cool things planned. We do a thing around here with legacy pricing where if you get a subscription with me and at some point like the price goes up, which doesn't happen very often, but if that does happen, you get to keep your your same price even if it goes up for as long as you want to keep the subscription. So might be a good time if it's something you've thought about doing to become a podcast premium subscriber, it's choose your rate. You cancel at any time. And if you want to listen to an older episode and you don't have any money, all you have to do is email us and we definitely will hook you up. But if you can contribute a little something, it makes a difference. And like I said, there's going to be new reasons to become a supporter soon to learn more about becoming a podcast premium subscriber or find out about any of my stuff, that weekly teacher song that I mentioned and my regular classes, all the stuff I'm doing can be found at jbrownyoga.com. Okay, I think that's good, y'all. Like I said, I'll touch base with you for a bit on the other side. But for now, let's go ahead and get into this. Let's listen to this conversation that I had with Lisa Peterson. Hello. Hello, Jay. Hi, Lisa. How are you? I'm doing pretty good. It's really a pleasure to meet you voice to voice like this. Thank you so much for making this time. I know we had some challenges to get here, but I'm happy to have arrived in this moment with you. Absolutely. I cannot tell you how much I've been looking forward to this conversation and I feel like you're an old friend. I've been listening to you for so long. Oh, that's so sweet. I didn't know that you necessarily listened to the show, so that makes things feel more comfortable for me, because if you've listened, then you kind of do know me a little bit, and that puts me at ease. Thank you. Yeah, and for me too. Well, I've wanted to talk to you for some time, because as you know, our mutual friend Jamie, shout out to Jamie, We've been having an ongoing conversation and exchange over the last few years together, which has also been a common thread here on the show. Um, and by the way, I you've listened to the show, so you know, but I feel compelled to say I'm already recording and we just began, okay? Absolutely. I uh, won't tell anybody where the crown jewels are. It's all good. <laughs> well, you know, I just don't want it to be a surprise. But um, I was going to say, Jamie and I have been having this exchange and it's been a conversation on the show for years now around like the influence of somatics into yoga. And the question that Jamie and I have always been having is like, is there a difference between them? (laughs) And if so, what is the difference? And Jamie, like a lot of people who feel, feel very influenced by somatic movement modalities, sometimes wonder, well, Am I teaching yoga? Is this even yoga anymore? So you seem to me to be a person perfectly placed at the intersection of yoga and somatics. So I was looking forward to having this moment to pick your brain. And I guess right. my, quest- my question to you is kind of the question I always ask people who are kind of combining these things, which is, did one come first? Did yoga come into your life first and then you discovered somatic movement modalities or was it the other way around? Oh, that's an interesting one. So 
I, let's see, let's track back briefly. I schlepped off to India in 2000, gave up my previous job, went there for two months and came back two and a half years later. So that was my initial step into that world. And I came back as a trained yoga therapist, yoga teacher, um, and then launched into other training when I got back to Ireland. I was lucky enough to... Wait, I'm sorry to stop you, but can I ask you why? Why did you go to India in the first place? And then why did you stay? <laughs> like, I'm uh, curious about that because that is about the yoga part of what you do. And that's a considerable life turn. And I'm curious how that happens for you. It was. It was very much a sliding doors moment. So my background before then had been in the film business, um, on, not on the camera side of the film business, but on the production side. So I'd been working in film, television, documentaries for a long time. And like many of us in that world, I, I burnt out on the last gig that I did. It was a big one. Ewan McGregor, lots of egos, etc. So I decided I'd take myself off for, you know, the year out that many people take. I was about 28 at the time. And I thought I'd go Laos, Vietnam, Cambodia, Australia, and home. And I bought a ticket that took me all of those routes. And I started in India, in the south, in Kerala. And about three weeks in... Some of the people I was hanging out with on the beach said, hey, do you want to come up and do this yoga thing in the jungle in the Shivananda Ashram? And I said, sure, I'll try it. And that was my, the beginning of my yoga journey. Um, something happened there that, where it was very clear that it was the thing that I was supposed to do. Um, so I stayed. <laughs> Nice. Mm. Left, cancelled the ticket to Laos, Vietnam, Cambodia, went to Australia, earned some more money, went back to India and got a, a yoga visa the second time that I was there. So I was able to stay for another full year and study yoga, ther yoga therapy at the Vivekananda Kendra Ashram, which is a therapy and research uh, hospital, actually. So I guess my curiosity is that that thing that you said where you're like, this is what I'm supposed to be doing. I had that happen to me too. A lot of people I know who stay in yoga for many, many years, that has happened for them. And I guess, was there like a particular moment or event or was it just a feeling inside yourself? No, there was very clearly a moment. Um, we, I left the ashram with two German nurses, Lars and Birgit. I will always remember them. And we were in a little porch in a house that we had rented after the, tr after the three weeks of the immersion. And the sun was going down and it was slanting through the trees. And they said to me, it looks like you can remember some of that yoga stuff. Would you teach us something? So I said, sure. They rolled out their mats and I rolled out mine. And words started coming out of my mouth that I didn't know were there. It was as if, as if something pre-programmed, had been pushed. And that was the first time that I thought, I could make a career out of this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so it was natural. Two, it felt natural to do it. It did. It yeah. did. And of course, there were a bunch of things that led to that. I had been, you know, a gymnast as a young person. The shapes came really easily for me. Um, and I'd always had a really, really deep interest in what makes people tick. And that element of yoga is profoundly wonderful for me. And did you ever have a moment where you're like, am I really going to give up a, a lucrative career working with you and McGregor to go study yoga? Oh, I was done with the <laughs> film business at that point. I was so done. Um, yeah, interestingly, when I came back to Ireland, I got offered another gig with a director who wanted to bring the same crew back together. And it was so different when I went back with my yoga experience because I had people out doing yoga at lunchtime. <laughs> you know, I had them all breathing in the office. It was, yeah. it was completely different, but I, I had already switched at that point. Uh, right. Yeah. And so the, what made you go to Vivekananda? What brought you to that particular school? 
There weren't that many schools that were doing yoga therapy. And I also wanted a research institute where there was ongoing academic um, research in the place where I was studying. So mm. uh, that's what took me there. Were you academically minded in your life? And that is that why that was important to you? I just, I guess. You want it to be something. legit. There were a lot of, you know, 20, 30 day trainings in India, as there are all over the world, going down at the time. And I wanted to go deeper. And I, I'm, I have done a lot of yoga study. And um, so I just have that sort of personality. Well, yeah, you two years at the Vivekananda Kendra was probably pretty intensive study. When oh, say, I wasn't there for a full two years. That's, oh, okay. I would definitely not have lasted it for a full <laughs> two years. I was there for about five, six months. I see, I see, I see. And then I guess... That training, was that like a lot of Ayurveda training as well? What made it go from yoga to yoga therapy at that school? Well, we had various departments. So we had a department for cardiac issues, um, GID, obesity, mental health. And Amazing. as a trainee in that school, you basically uh, were up at five in the morning leading a yoga nidra with the clients that were in the yoga therapy hospital and doing your studies as you worked under the supervision of Ayurvedic doctors and trained yoga therapists. So it's mm. really interesting. Yeah, I'm sure. And I guess I'm, my curiosity there is, were you learning like set protocols for those conditions? Like if they have this, then you give them this, or was it more still like an intuitive teacher student process? That is such an insightful question, Jay. <laughs> we, we had, it shows your experience. We had s specific protocols. Yeah. And if I spoke to the more senior therapists, what they would say is the power of yoga is the power of yoga. You take somebody out of their stressful life environment, you put them in an ashram type situation, you apply good food, good rest, good company, and whatever yoga you do will work. That was kind of the secret subtext underneath mm. the, the clear protocols of this for this and that for that. Mm, interesting. Well, that was a seed planted in you, at least, by some teacher, at least. Because if you don't ever get that seed, if it's just protocols, then you wouldn't necessarily know or have a th an authority person kind of say that to you. Exactly. Interesting. So when you came back from your studies in India to Ireland, I guess, is what you said, did you start teaching yoga? I did. I was one of those teachers that went, walked around with my flyers and stuck them up. Um, it became very clear when I was back that therapy as it is taught in the East is different to therapy as it's taught in the West, yoga therapy. Mm. So I then did another two years of yoga therapy in Ireland and then there was another sliding door moment. I went to study with Donna Fari in 2004, and that was the beginning of informing my yoga journey in a whole new way. Yes, I've had experiences with Donna too. <laughs> she does that to people. Well, well, before we go the, to your somatic, one more thing about the yoga therapy trainings you've had. You mentioned just now that there was a big difference between yoga therapy training in the East and yoga therapy training in the West. And I'm curious, were they looking at the yoga practices to treat conditions in India through the same kind of scientific or Western medicine lens that I think often happens in Western like yoga therapy training? Hmm. I think because VK is a research institute, there was a lot of really good research going on there and bodies are bodies. Um, we did definitely have some practices, um, some of the internal cleansing practices, which in the West we just simply wouldn't mm, offer a Western person. Mm -hmm. um, but I think that was really the main difference. The rest of the practices were pretty much the same. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I get it. Well, what was it then when you met Donna? I, I kind of know the answer maybe, but what what was it that was lack? I want to say lacking, but or what opened up that felt like, oh, you said it was another 
doorway moment for you? What was that experience or what was that realization to yourself of like, Ooh, there's more for me to go or a different direction for me to go in? Sure. I think there are certain teachers and it's individual for all of us. But when I first heard Donna teach it, the felt sense was like every cell in my body was lighting up. It was really a sensate thing. Um, so that experience is really strong for a lot of people when the body says yes in such a clear way. It's most of us follow it. So that, that was the beginning and the fact that she has, you know, four books, had done so much writing. It was really easy then to access her teachings. Um, yeah, I trusted my gut. <laughs> and I had the same experiences uh, with Amy Matthews because she and I, most of my earliest um, yoga class experiences, Amy was in the class next to me, but she was already very rooted in different somatic movement modalities. And it wasn't until years later that I like took a course of hers and got to kind of experience her as a teacher and get a taste of her uh, BMC, Bonnie Bainbridge Cohen um, work. And I guess that's a big influence on Donna too. Was Donna somebody who turned you on to some of these other somatic movement modalities or did you also come to them from other places as well? Oh, it's a funny question. So I, I studied with Donna 2004 and I've been working and studying with her ever since. But about 2008, I decided, okay, I would like to see part of what is informing Donna's teaching. So I took myself off to Berkeley, which is not the shortest commute, I can tell you, Dublin to Berkeley. I did Dublin, Berkeley, 2008 to 2010 to do the Embodied Anatomy and Yoga program, which is where I met Amy. Um, and I also started studying pretty consistently with Amy since then. So I think of the two of those people as two luminary souls in my yoga journey. Me too. <laughs> Me too. Yeah. And I guess the other big question I have, because I am, I have like a fair amount of familiarity with uh, the BMC work through Amy and just through conversations. But the other thing that's come up uh, for me with you specifically. And it just recently, I had somebody on the show. His name's Rick Olderman. He's like a PT or uh, kind of not your usual PT, but he does this kind of uh, systems analysis kind of brand of uh, PT work. And there was a moment in my conversation with him where I was basically asking him about how there are all kinds of people and situations who have pain that doesn't always just get easily solved through like biomechanical considerations and that sometimes pain happens in people's bodies for lots of different reasons and I said what do you do in those kind of situations and he said oh that's when I bring in the hanosomatics okay and, and I had only heard the only other place I had heard hanosomatics before like even that specific uh person was from Jamie. Jamie's like, oh, Lisa has this hanosomatics influence. And he's been kind of referring to that when I've been working with him over the last few years. And I just don't know very much about that. So what, where does the hanosomatics come in for you? Where did you study that? Sure. Sure. Um, let's Maybe we could backtrack into the what somatics is to start, just to set the stage a little bit for you. That's listeners. actually because a great, you know, I actually wrote that at the top of my notes to start there, but we jumped in and I skipped over it. <laughs> That's a good place. That's good that you went back for us. So let's do that. What, how would you define it? So somatics is basically any somatic practice is a practice where we experience ourselves from the inside out. Uh, so the word was coined in 1976 by Thomas Hanna, who is the founder of a branch of somatics called Hanna Somatics, and that operates out of the Novato Institute in California. And Tom was looking for a word that would sort of synthesize all of these mind-body experiences that people were having in Esalen and different kinds of practices that were ongoing. So anything where we are having a felt sense 
a felt inner sense experience of the body is by definition somatic. So I think of it as a big, beautiful oak tree, and that oak tree has branches like biodynamic craniosacral therapy in body work or rolfing. It has branches like yoga or somatic experiencing or Bessel van der Kolk's work. You can draw somatically, paint somatically, anything where you're present with yourself and your inner experiences by definition somatic. So it's very broad. Um, and it gets confusing then when people say, oh, I do somatics. It's a bit, a little bit like saying, I do yoga. Or they do <laughs> isomatic know. yoga. See, when they say, I do somatic yoga, isn't yoga just somatic? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. So I kind of think of myself as a cross-pollinator. So I have, you know, Donifar, Donifar, his yoga lineage is very somatic. I yes. have spent all this time in body-mind centering, which, as you know, is one of the primary somatic modalities out there. And then I also trained as a clinical somatic educator within HANA Somatics. So, yeah, cross-pollinator slash ambassador between those worlds. Um, and I use them all because they work. And I use them all because I think anything that is worth its salt will be found and repeated and mirrored in different systems. So when I find a truth, and I find it again and again and again and again, it gives me a lot of confidence in the system and in the, yeah, the how the system is also universal. So that's kind of an intro. <laughs> yeah, no, that's perfect. I think that's clarifying uh, in terms of what somatics is and how yoga fits into it and how they're not necessarily separate, uh, yeah. but they they are big umbrellas, both of them, yoga and somatics in a way. I guess, does Hannah somatics, as Thomas Hannah taught them, have like a specific defining characteristic to it, like different from, say, like Bonnie Bainbridge Cohen's work? Uh -huh. So Tom was the first person to um, invite Moshe Feldenkrais to the United States way back in the day. So the lineage that that comes from, if you like, would be Tom Hanna as the founder of Hanna Somatics. The grandfather would be Moshe Feldenkrais and the great grandfather would be Alexander's technique. So you're in that lineage. Um, and I have studied, I haven't studied Alexander, but I have studied Feldenkrais. I'm not professionally qualified in it, um, but I've done it for a bunch of years as well as Hannah Somatics. And I think what I love most about Tom Hannah's work is that it's practical, it's accessible, it's repeatable. It just gives people a whole big bang for their book in a very, very short amount of time. And as you and I both know, when we're dealing with folk coming in off the street, they don't necessarily want to always do the deep, deep, deep dive. Um, so when I started doing the work, I was getting the same kind of results in six weeks with the, the Hannah Somatics as I was getting in six months with my yoga therapy clients. And it just became a no-brainer to, to do the work that way and to offer it. Um, so some of the some of the things that would be kind of characteristic would be the idea of pandiculating instead of stretching. You know that word? Pandiculation. No, what's that word? Please repeat. <laughs> pandiculation is going to be your new favorite word yes. of the day, Jay. So it comes from the Latin to yawn. And a pandiculation is basically a full body yawn. Um, so if you watch cat or dog or baby or any animal, uh, before they get up from sleeping, they do a big extensor style stretch with a yawn, they release their jaw, and then they go about their day. Mm -hmm. And no cat or dog would get up without doing appendiculation. So what it does is it basically um, engages the sensory motor cortex and resets the length of the muscle, which is why your cat can go from sleeping to catching a bird within about 2.5 seconds flat. Mm. Um, so in a, what a, the official definition of a pandiculation is a shortening or concentric contraction, which is stronger than the current muscle tonus 
followed by a lengthening or eccentric contraction, followed by relaxation, which is a bit of a mouthful, but nonetheless mm. for your physio and more yes, academically they're going to be so self. happy with that. That's, yes, very clear. That's the tradition. So what happens for in practice, for example, if you have, let's say, a tight paravertebrals in your lumbar spine, what we might do in a physical therapy session or in a massage th- session or even in a yoga session is we might try and release those muscles through massaging or stretching, passive work over a bolster. There's lots of ways to do it. And what we do in hand semantics is we say, well, if the nervous system wants to go that way, if there's already contraction and tone, high tone, why don't we go the way the nervous system wants to go even more and then slowly, slowly, slowly release out? So it's a way of resetting the nervous system so that you basically, the muscles stay long. It's brilliant. It really is brilliant. I see. So it is about, in a way, stimulating a nervous system response to relax the system. Is that a fair way to say it? Relax definite- your muscles. You said muscles. Do you mean specifically muscles or it's kind of everything, right? Well, muscle slash myofascial continuities, if yeah, we're being yeah. more, more anatomically. That's what I was saying, yeah. <laughs> Where do you draw the line? Is what I was saying. And we don't have any lines anymore or yes. levers. That's the whole point. Yes. Um, in Tom's day, you know, there were there was very much talk about muscles. We weren't really in the fascial realm yet. Mm. Um, those of us that are teaching the work now, of course, we're talking about relationships, um, front body, back body, side body, diagonal body, inner body. And as you know from the BMC work, nothing exists mm. and nothing works or moves in the body that is not moving a whole bunch of other parts. Um so yes, when we talk about pendiculation, we might zoom out and be looking at the bigger picture, um, or we might zoom in and be looking at a more local picture of well, what's happening in that part of your back, or that part of your chest, or that part of your abdomen, for example. Do you want to try a pendiculation with me? <laughs> we do one sure. Here. What do we do? Go Come for on. it. Why the hell not? Anybody <laughs> listening can do it too. I love that. Let's a- go for it. Absolutely. Super simple, just to get a sense of it. So... If you're the sort of person that likes to wear your shoulders up around your ears, as many of us do, it's very fashionable, we have tight shoulders, it's common to have a little bit of extra tone in your shoulder muscles. So for wherever your shoulders are now, bring your shoulders up towards your ears and then release them again. And do that, let's do that together. Bring the shoulders up towards the ears and then release them. So that's not a pendiculation, that's simply contracting and relaxing. Mm -hmm. We bring the shoulders up towards the ears, and as we bring them up, we notice the muscles that start to get tighter, and then we consciously release those self-same muscles slowly as we come back down. And try that on for size a few times. So if we draw the muscles up towards the ears, notice the gliding short And then slowly put your brain in your shoulder muscles. Slowly, 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 slowly release. And turn off all the effort of the bottom. And you might find that the position of your shoulders is different from where you started. All right. So when you... There's two questions in that. Yeah. Is it important... I mean, I did it without thinking about it. The second time where we're placing attention as we're bring, letting the shoulders come back down, my sho- I let my shoulders come down very slowly, but the first time I let them just kind of drop. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. And is it the, is the slower movement part of it, or is that just me putting that on it? That you are completely correct. The slower movement is part of it. So we create, as you do in your yoga practice, I am sure, mm-hmm. we create a deliberately simplified space where we can observe what we're doing in a mindful way and place the brain in the body in a specific, in a specific place. So sometimes I will say, put your brain in your back or put your brain in your knee or put your brain in your shoulder. So we get a, a clear sense of focus so that we get some, a repatterning of the nervous system. Because you know what it's like when you go for massage, you feel lovely after the massage, everything is long. 
But then because your brain is the thing that tells your muscles to contract, if you haven't changed the underlying pattern, then your muscles just go back to where they were before. So you want with, I think, with if you want work to last and if you want work to be practical, we need to engage our own nervous systems in any pattern change. Ooh, I really want to get more into this pa- pattern change. But before we do that, I have one other question that has sure. to do with you were saying that using the Hannah somatic stuff was helping people much quicker than like the mm-hmm. yoga therapy stuff. And I'm curious about <laughs> why, what was, I have a suspicion. A lot of it probably has to do with languaging. I imagine, but what, What do you think was different about that influence that was having such a a good effect so quickly that wasn't happening in the yoga therapy world? I think it's because we, in Hannah Somatics, we orient people to use their brains to change their bodies from the get-go. So it's a very internal, mindful, notice what you notice in the moment process. Um, That's the first reason. And the second reason is that pendiculation is really simple to do, but incredibly effective. And every time you do it, there is new length. And I, I, yeah, it, I, that sounds, you know, I sound very, I don't want to sound preachy with that in any way. Uh, no, no, I don't think it sounds I've just done all preachy. these things. I've done all these things for a bunch of years and a lot of them, you know, with a very deep level of study. So I've had a really privileged position of being able to compare modalities with real people. And Mm -hmm. real people are who we want to help because we're all real people. I I think that a lot of us have specifically uh, embraced somatic movement modalities because we've seen that it actually seems to facilitate what we're looking for from the yoga practice in ways that... Mm -hmm we weren't getting from more traditional yoga teachings and approaches. And, Mm -hmm. you know, I understand the trepidation and me just saying that I was like, "Uh Oh, can I say that? (laughs) Am I allowed to say that as a yoga teacher? But I think we can, because there are certainly traditions of yoga that are more uh, individualized in their approaches. You know, I think that it seems like um, what I'm curious about is the, I'm curious about a couple couple things. I'm not sure where to go first. I think the thing I, I'm curious about, like the actual kind of technique and process of practice that's mm-hmm. evolving in yoga that I do think is coming from the somatic world in the way that you just described it, in the sense that instead of having people start with alignment and then maybe start to figure out how things feel later. (laughs) You, you start with people figuring out how things feel from inside and then actually letting the form kind of go to that more. Um, Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so I I guess let's start with that. And I I know that you, I saw on your website, you employ the seven moving principles of Donna Fari. And I guess do you think that those principles kind of, it seems like those were a good way for you to marry some of the somatic approach and yoga. Would you say that's true? Let's, let's go back to a regular yoga class for a moment, I think, and I will answer your question. Okay, I just yeah. want to tie it, tie it back. Anybody that steps on a mat, straight off the street, morning class, evening class, we need to warm up. So we can't jump straight into sun salutations, or maybe we could when we're younger, but it doesn't necessarily serve us, or maybe it serves particular sorts of personalities. But in general, no dancer, no gymnast, no athlete would enter a practice without warming up. So we have specific things like cat cow and simple things that we do in yoga that that warm our students up. Why not include some easy somatic floor-based movements in those things? And if we're doing, hmm, so let's say reverse trikonasana is my kind of pose of the day. What would it be like to explore a whole series of rotational movements for the thoracic spine and some movements for the hips and the legs in a simple floor-based places? 
And if those same movements could actually bring all the muscles into a balanced tone, what would then happen when we take our reverse trikonasana or our back bend? So I spent a bunch of time going, okay, today's focus is going to be, let's say, a back bend, back bending class. What is it that we need to do in what I traditionally do in yoga if I was going to do that? I would need to release the hip flexors. I would need to release the pectoralis muscles. I would need to release the shoulders. There might be some other areas that I'd work on. So I go, well, what somatic exercises do that fastest, most efficiently, and most effectively? And what will bring that person more or less into their best balance in this moment? So that when we get to do the yoga, it's easier and we're not fighting against ourselves. So <laughs> you asked, is there a difference between yoga and somatics? And my, if you went to one of my local classes here, you know, my students would say, hmm, not quite sure which part is the somatic component and which part is the yoga component. And I'm not sure if that's whether because I have managed to weave them together so seamlessly that they don't notice or that it just makes sense because movement is movement. Movement is movement. You also wrote on your website that asana is a practice of meditation and motion. And I guess, do you distinguish in your mind at all between like the movement explorations of like you doing cat cow, is that different than doing the other kind of somatic movement explorations you're going to do on the floor? And I guess around that, is it my question sometimes has to do with like the use of form, like cat cow is a very specific thing. Inhale, reverse arch, exhale, rounding of your spine, depending on the languaging you use. But other kinds of exercises are more like, hmm, think about the spiral and then do kind of a movement improv. Like Amy was always just sure. like, she'd give sure. you a thing and then you were on your own to just kind of move okay. however you wanted to move in a more free form way. And those yeah. feel like very different things to me. Yes. Yes. And I, I also feel like a little bit of amb an ambassador for the, for the body mind centering world. So I have trod the fine line between offering form and offering freedom within the form. And knowing that, particularly for new students, some structure, and I'd love to hear your opinion on this too, some structure is useful because we need it. Once we know that not everybody is the same, and once we offer the student the ability to inquire and change and a whole bunch of agency within that structure. So I'm not... Mm, at the last time, often if I study with Amy, in an hour and a half class, we might do six movements. I'm not on that side of the spectrum yet. Maybe I will be <laughs> at some point. <laughs> I aspire as but, well, yes. <laughs> um, but I do believe if we go back to... Let's go back to yield and Donna's seven moving principles and the develop, developmental movement patterns, for example, and we take cat-cow. So we could do cat-cow from simple flexion extension, as you said. We could do cat-cow from traveling through the front bodies of the vertebra in a very specific way, still in flexion extension. We could do cat-cow from the hyoid bone. We could do it from a pandiculation, you can try this later, a pandiculation, so the muscles of the back body gliding short along the whole spine and then gliding long, so short as you arch and long as you round. We, we could, could do, do it, it visualizing jellyfish, which I saw. We could do it visualizing <laughs> jellyfish. We could do it from homologous support, yeah. but, but not necessarily, uh, and I don't want, again, I don't want to be disrespectful here, but from things that are anatomically possible, feasible, correct, um, tangible. So not necessarily only in the visualization imagination world where we might do it from, let's say, the jellyfish, the diaphragm of the jellyfish, but from the developmental work of Bonnie Bainbridge-Cohen. So how does a baby find ease on their hands and knees? Well, part of how they find ease is they find broadness between their shoulder braids and broadness across their pelvic bones. And that's a pattern called homologous, et cetera, et cetera. So there are just so many ways we can bake in embodied anatomy, 
developmental movement and somatic movement into something really simple like cat-cow. And in my experience, my own experience, that also keeps it fresh. It keeps the movement fresh and lively, and it gives my brain novelty. It gives me a whole scope of practice where I can learn and where I have layers upon layers upon layers that I can share with my students or my trainee teachers if they're interested, if they want to go there. Yeah, we're, we're very much in agreement. I, I'm someone who needs a lot of structure, like even bringing myself to practice sometimes, like I'm not one of those people who just lays down on the floor and rolls around and does whatever I feel. Like I just, I kind of need a structure, Mm -hmm. but I found that if I hold too tightly to that structure or I'm obsessive about a structure, it left me lacking. And that's where this freedom component came in. You know, I think of even like Eric Schiffman and freedom yoga. And I remember talking to him and him saying, oh, it used to be five minutes in his hour and a half yoga class. He would just put music on and people would just move around however they wanted to. And then by the time he was about to retire, it was like the whole class was just that. (laughs) And so when you talk about Amy doing, you know, five movements, the whole class, I relate because I do think that people kind of discovering their own movement and kind of improvising movement. I have some background in like postmodern dance. We did a lot of contact improv and stuff and that kind of moving from within or kind of free form improvisatory space is so vital and valuable. Um, So I think that it kind of depends. There's some days where I really want a structure to stick to, but then there are other days where I I want the freedom to just let go of the structure and move free, you know, in a new way or something. Absolutely. Um, And so I guess it's like what you're saying, like we want to have some structure, but we're just, we have an understanding that we're not going to hold to it necessarily. We're very happy to let go of it on an instant, you know? (laughs) I think it keeps it interesting. It keeps it real. It keeps it novel. And remember, our brains, human brains, love novelty. We love doing something different. And the beauty of a form is that we can also, by returning to the form again and again and again, we can notice change in ourselves, which is part of what I like about the Hannah Somatic work as well as the yoga work that I offer by having... If you are hearing this message, then you're listening to the free version of J. Brown Yoga Talks. To hear the rest of our conversation, please subscribe to Podcast Premium at jbrownyoga.com slash premium.